whites are so evenly divided that every time they vote, uh, the race is so close, they have to go back and count the votes all over again. And then, which means that any block, any minority that has a block of votes that stick together is in a strategic position. Either way you go, that's who gets it. You're, you're in a position to determine who go to the White House and who stay in the doghouse. You're the one who has that power. You can keep Johnson in Washington, D.C., or you can send him back to his Texas cotton patch. You're the one who sent Kennedy to Washington. You're the one who put the present Democratic administration in Washington, D.C. The whites were evenly divided. It was the fact that you threw 80% of your votes behind the Democrats that put the Democrats in the White House. When you see this, you can see that the Negro vote is the key factor. And despite the fact that you are in a position to, de to be the determining factor, what do you get out of it? The Democrats have been in Washington, D.C. only because of the Negro vote. They've been down there four years. And they're all other legislation they wanted to bring up, they've brought it up and gotten it out of the way, and now they bring up you. And now they bring up you. You put them first and they put you last. Because you're a chump. Washington, D.C., in the House of Representatives, there are 257 who are Democrats. Only 177 are Republicans. In the Senate, there are 67 uh, Democrats. Only 33 are Republicans. The party that you backed controls two-thirds of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and still they can't keep their promise to you, because you're a chump. controls two-thirds of the government and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time and you are dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party you are not only a chump but you're a traitor to your race Can't you get that through your thick skull? Yes, sir. It got through that time. It understands it all now. Well, at least you free. You failed me, Fiddler. And what we'll do about that, we'll discuss at a later time. Yes. Your name is Toby. I want to hear you say it. Your name is Toby. You're going to learn to say your name. Let me hear you say it. What's your name? Kunta. Kunta Kinte. When the master gives you something, you take it. He gave you a name. It's a nice name. It's Toby. And it's going to be yours till the day you die.
Now, I know you understand me, and I want to hear it. Again! <laughs> I want to hear you say your name. Your name is Toby. What's your name? Gunther. Lord God, help that boy. They're gonna whip him dead. What's your name? Say it! Toby! Who are you? Say your name. What's your name? Toby. Hi. Say it again. Say it louder so they all can hear you. What's your name? Toby. My name is Toby. Hi. That's a good nigger. Cut him down. Master, Master, yeah. Master Beater, do anything you want to her. Anything, Master. Tear the skin off her worthless hide. She an awful nigger to do such a thing, Master. Please, Master, in the name of Jesus, have mercy. Me and Toby, we give you our lives, Massa. Massa. Forty years, Massa. Forty years I serve you. Don't that God but Well, you're doing your hey. job. She disobeyed the rules. She has to suffer the consequences. That's all there is to it. Massa, please. Please, Massa. Massa, I beg you, please, don't sell her. Please, Massa. She's already been sold. Oh, then, Master, please sell me in bell with her. But don't split up the family, Master. You ain't never been that kind of man. Please, Master. Mr. Tom Moore owns Kizzy now. Mr. Odell will take her away today. Master. No, no, I don't want to go. God, my baby. No, no. Look, Lee. Poor Manny Bell. Oh, no, yeah. no. Thursday night edition of the No PC Show. Wanted to start off with that little piece there. I know everybody's seen Roots. I watch it maybe four or five times a year. Maybe just as a r reminder of the the crap we put up with, the the mentality that has us where we are in America as black people. Uh, a, a lot of those scenes and, and my favorite scene is, is just with Chicken George and Master Mo and he say to Master Mo, you ain't never gonna let me go as your Master Mo. And Master Mo says, use my nigga George. When you gonna get that through your head? 
And Chicken Joy says, I got it now. That's the same thing America is saying to us on a daily basis. I know plenty of successful black people and I know plenty of white folks that's not bad white folks. Some of them may even try to be helpful. But it's a vast majority that doesn't see the world the way we see the world and what's going on in the world no matter what. They think it's actually a fair and even thing going on here in America. That if you work hard and go to school, well, basically do all the things that we as white people have said in this country to be successful, then you too can be successful. The strange thing is, is if that's true, why are black people staying poor? It's got to be something wrong if blacks are getting educated, more educated, striving, making more income, then why are blacks still staying poor? Why is the 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 poverty line it stays consistent? The the average black family and, and I got my own theories on this has maybe a, a wealth of and we're talking about two working people in a family making a, a, a decent salary, maybe seventy five thousand a, a piece. Why do they only have ten to fifteen thousand dollars worth of wealth in the bank? But what and, and why do the white people same counterparts same salary, but they average about. Sixty-five to one hundred twenty thousand dollars in the bank, uh, as far as wealth and homes and things like that. It's it's a lot of reasons. Some some of the reasons are blacks don't take care of their money the right way, they don't spend it the right way. People always say, "You should invest in the stock market." How many black companies are on, on the stock market? Really? If you plan the stock market, you are investing in white businesses probably 98% of the time. Why are Forbes and Bloomberg doing reports on black wealth, black poverty? Isn't Forbes a Fortune 500 magazine or, I mean, company? And and Bloomberg, they're, they're right up there, too. They're, they're these financial giants. But yet they felt it was important to discuss what's going on in black America. So the title of the show was Niggas in America, Negroes in America, whatever you want to call yourself or, or call it. There's something seriously wrong with us as as black people. And I, I don't know any way to, to dance around it. I can say it's a, a generational thing. I can, I can say it, it stems from slavery and then it stems from Jim Crow. And I can point like a lot of younger people vote uh, point toward the people that came before them, which is which is us. You know, I'm at the end of the of, of the baby boomers, 1965, when I was born. That's that's the end of the baby boomers. But that's also when we were just getting all our our civil rights. So I'm born right in the middle of the civil rights era where finally blacks are supposed to have these great opportunities. And that's what kills me about a, a, a lot of white folks. They think, well, 
and that was I, I did the show and the white woman said hey if you haven't made it in in America in the last 50 years then you only have yourself to blame so subconsciously she knew about everything else and what we did to, to hold you down but now we're not screwing with you like we used to the government's not making laws like they used to to keep you down you want to be a part of our America then here's your chance to be a part of our America and like I say I know a lot of successful black people if you want to call it success if success is going to work for these these people then spending your money with these people and then trying to do what these people do and have your summer vacation and your winter vacation and never invest nothing back into your your old communities other than when we go to church and we put some in the collection plate you know we 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 will go to church and we'll join a program and and we'll call that a a co commitment and then you realize some of the programs you join like a mentoring program or something like that you'll see the government stepping in on that see it's all about control and managing people when they built those projects and they first it was immigrants they put in and then they started putting black people in there then the quality of life you, you stacked all this poverty on top of each other and you created your own little crime to prison pipeline they knew what they were doing when they did this when 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 we were in these buildings when we were in these communities now these same communities you ride through and 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 all this money that wasn't available to keep the buildings up when we lived in them Oh, we don't need the buildings no more. We're going to tear down the buildings. We're going to put Mariano's whole food, everything. It's beautiful now. It's prime real estate. Some of those scenes from Roots, and, and when I, I watch Roots, I, I maybe I watch from a different perspective than a lot of other people. Everything that happened in slavery was done to oppress you. I'm going to kidnap you. And then I'm say I'm going to say crazy stuff to you. That makes no sense. If you run away from me and I didn't kidnap you and brought you here, you wrong and you need to be punished. If you speak up to me, a white man in my country, you need to be punished. That's the same mentality we deal with now. And all my black friends or whatever in corporate America, if if you if hey, tell me I'm lying. That's they say, hey, you lying. Tell me it's it's great in corporate America. Tell me you haven't been passed over time and time again and had to keep your mouth closed. Most of the successful black people in corporate America have have learned to keep your mouth shut, keep your head down. Don't question the authority and we'll let you have a little bit. See, but that little bit costs. You, you see, you're getting a little bit. But then it's costing you a lot on the, on the back end. It's it's a cesspool. It's a system. It's, it's their system. So this this what bothers me with uh, a lot of people about not supporting black businesses. Why should I support this black business? They they not giving me the service I want. They not doing it like the white folks do it. White folks can mess up and you go right back to them. Oh, they made me feel good. They came out and they said, "Well, we sorry." Can we help you? Oh, no problem. We're sorry that 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 happened. Black establishment. But what's going on? 
Oh, well, shit, but we ain't never had this problem before. Uh, well, uh, you know, we're going to take care of it. Whole different tone. And, 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 and we don't like our own people. Well, like ourselves half the time. Seems like we get successful or perceive success. And we change. It's a known fact that blacks in America now identify with white folks more than we identify with anybody in Africa. Because they took a lot from us. That's the bottom line. They took your culture, took your language, took your religion. But we still running around here trying to celebrate the 4th of July. For what? For what, really? Why would I be waving a flag that represented my enslavement? Don't tell me it's, it's, it's changed because it still represents my enslavement. The mental enslavement, the reason we can get out here and try to make more money and everything and the, and the wealth gap is still still huge is because a lot of these folks got inheritance or white people have been working and making money in America since they got here. We haven't. What, what's your inheritance? When somebody die in our family, we, we basically trying to take up a collection half the time. Somebody die in their family, they got the right insurance that says, oh, grandma died, but this half a million dollar policy that she had, it's really going to really help. We're going to put her up, put her away real nicely. And we're going to take this wealth and we're not going to spend it in the Chinese community and we're not going to spend it in the black community or any other community. We're going to put it back into our community. So if, if we like these communities, these white communities so much, why can't we do the same thing in our communities? You want to know why? Because we so used to the bullshit. We deal in bullshit. We raised in bullshit. At some point, you got to say, hey, it's bullshit. And, you know, everybody's got their opinions on what's what. We accept a lot of, of stuff from family members, from people in the community. And it's the same people that are destroying our community. I understand it's hard out here. I was talking to a friend today on the train. I was like, what happened to the resources in the community? What happened to the training facilities in the community? You know why all that stuff dried up and left? Because the plan was to get these communities back. I'm talking to my teacher in 1983, Mr. Phillips. And we're talking about this exact same thing I'm talking about now. We're talking about gentrification. We're talking about Harold Washington becoming the mayor. And we're talking about what's going to happen over the next 30 years to black folks as we get pushed out into the suburbs and the white folks move back into the city, raise the, the value of the property, and you locked out. So either this man was a, a absolute prophet or he had seen it many times. Now, you got a lot of people with this outcry. Oh, it's terrible in the neighborhoods. We need the National Guard. You're falling right into their plan. Donald Trump's already says, hey, I'm all for stop and frisk. It's great. Who is it great for? How often do you see white people getting stopped and frisked? Really? I have. Can, can I say? I've never seen a, a white person get stopped and frisked. I just had to think about it. Never, never seen it. Been, been out with white 
white friends. They get obnoxious. The police come. I'm quiet. The police want to give me the full search. They get a, hey, buddy, calm down. We got to understand who, who we're dealing with here, people. Every time you win, the rules change. And then they always come up with that. Well, well how, how is all this stuff that we did to you affecting you? How is this? Okay, so we killed some leaders. Oh, what the, So what? We killed them. Really? And then they throw these same leaders. Oh, well, what about Martin Luther King? Why don't you adopt his principle? Because it's truly about white fear. You know, th th there's no history of black people killing white folks in America. But white folks had the nerve to be afraid. That That's a a amazing. There's no history of us abusing white folks. Or really doing anything to white folks. Because we already know you do something to a white person. You probably go into jail for some real, real time. You do something to a black person. You may get a couple of years. Because we need you right back out here creating more havoc and, 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 and nonsense. So we got corrupt police, corrupt corrupt court system. Leading to prison. Where all the corporations are investing in, in the prisons. So we build the new prisons. The prison stocks have gone up since Donald Trump got in office. Because he's just stopping Fritz president. He does. He has... People still, please stop telling me that Donald Trump has a plan for black people. The plan for black people is I'm going to come in, occupy your neighborhoods, and put everybody on lockdown. And then I got more people for my prison. Why aren't they trying to build resource centers in, in neighborhoods? How often do you see high rises in black neighborhoods? That have businesses in them. Not really. But we got plenty of liquor stores. Plenty of churches. We. Are our own worst enemies. We can't keep pointing the finger at, at them. And what they do. Because we keep participating in their system. So how 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 we point the finger at them. If you know you're dealing with the devil, then you know you're dealing with the devil. We've been divided for so long, though. My individual success overrules everything as far as my people. At least that's how a, a, a lot of people are doing it. We don't collectively do our politics. We don't collectively do our education. We depend on these people. If you got a good education in America, then you should completely understand racism. This system teaches you to fall in line to their system. So you got to take the same student loan out if they even go to college. Because I've seen plenty of times they're not even in college. Or just starting college, you working on your job for 12 years or whatever, and they still get more opportunities than you. I'm listening today, this guy's got his door open, he's doing an interview with the white guy. And I clearly hear this guy says, well, you know, uh, I had a few problems, uh, a, a felony, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I cleaned up my life. I went to, to work, blah, blah, blah. And so when they get off the call, I liked him. I thought it was great. I, I think we should offer him the job. Let your black ass mention mis misdemeanor, let alone a felony. Okay, uh, sorry, Rakeem. This is just not going to work out. But we wish you luck. And that happens time and time again when you go to interview with these people. It's about what you know, but it's also about 
am I feeling am I feeling comfortable with this guy? Am, am I comfortable? Are are we comfortable? Nothing like sitting in the room getting interviewed by four or five white people. You got to entertain them a little bit if you want the job. They got to feel comfortable. They'll ask you questions, and, and this may sound unbelievable, but it happened to me. I'm in the interview, you know, and I guess he thought it was going to be a shock factor or something, you know, where it talked about a situation where uh, there's a known issue with uh, a program that's crashing systems, but me, the boss, I want to uh, go ahead and implement it anyway. Uh, uh, tell me how you would, would handle that. And I, and I said, well, I would say, hey, Scott, you know, I've, I've been researching this, this program, and from what I see, it's crashing a lot of systems, and, and maybe we need to research a little more before we implement it. And then he says, well, you know what? You don't know a damn thing about computers or anything. I want to put it out anyway. And, uh, you know, that's what we're going to do because you don't know what you're talking about. My response was, okay, where do you want to start? And they laughed and they said, you know what? We're not laughing at you, but the way you just calmly delivered it and came across, it was like, wow. It's, it's like you didn't, you didn't blink. Because they expect you to be the angry black that doesn't have control of his emotions. Talking to another white man, he couldn't believe, oh, you don't get mad, you don't get angry. This doesn't upset you. Why am I, as a black man, getting all these anger questions? Is there a fear of black men in corporate America? It's not a lot of us there. You keep the numbers small, so you stay in control. I've had a white man flip over desk, curse and everything. And they weren't questioning him after the incident. They were questioning me. And what did you do? Well, I, I sat there and continued to work. I, you know, I'm from an environment that as long as you don't touch me, you can, you can do somersaults and, and do whatever you want to do. But, you know, then they reworded. it. Well, we see that you guys have a problem with each other. No. I know a brick throw when I see one. I did nothing toward this man or anything, but here you are again, give me the rules and, and your system. Righteous indignation, just like the, the master was with Fiddler. I gave you an opportunity, nigga. You messed it up. That's my system. Just like the, the, the other master, I forgot his name that uh, sold kids y'all. You gotta follow the rules. Nobody thought to say, nigga, I'm a slave. What the? See, that's the way the system works. And, and we got to get used to that. And, and we got to get past our own individual, individual things. It's It's been, what, shit. It's been, what, 50, almost 50 some years since King got killed. 52 years since Malcolm got killed. We don't know who our, our freaking leaders are at this point. Don't listen to these people that's out here telling you about this reparation bill. It's only a bill to study the effects of slavery from 1692 to 1865. They're not even mentioning the next 150 years of Jim Crow that they threw out there. It's not even mentioned. America is full of hypocrisy. It is yet to come out and say, we did wrong to these black people and we need to repair it. They are not gonna repair it because as far as they're concerned, look, y'all doing good, y'all working it out. Y'all y'all catching up. We, we, we like the way the scales look right now. Y'all even behind the Latinos. And they don't complain as much. Or y'all behind the, the immigrants. And they don't complain as much. We give them the programs that, that you should be entitled to. But, you know, it's not our fault that you don't have the information. It's not our fault 
things are the way they are. It's your fault, nigga. Because you keep dealing with me. Love, peace, soul. We out of here.